Hello everyone, welcome to my first video and today we are going to be talking about and going through the process of seed starting. Now I'm starting all of my seedlings today, most of them actually, mostly my vegetables and the flowers I'm going to do a cold stratification process, but I thought we would begin by just showing you what I have here. Um, so right now, this is a 72 cell seed starting package I got from Canadian Tire. As you can see, they already put slots at the bottom. However, because the slots aren't very even and um, some of them are like mostly to one side, I decided to add some side slits just to increase greater airflow for the roots to grow. So there are 72 of them. It also comes with this tray that I'll be using to do water, uh, bottom watering. Uh, we also have foil, which we're going to be using to keep the steam in once we sterilize our potting mix, our seed starting mix. Um, this is soilless and it has heat moss, vermiculite, I hope I pronounced that right, right? Quar pith, and then lime also uh, for a pH adjuster. So we have that. Um, we have plastic bags, which we're going to be using to do our cold stratification for our perennial flowers. Of course, we have all of our seeds here. Um, another option that we have for folks who um, don't want to use plastic cells or who are looking to um, minimize waste and also save money, you can use egg cartons um, to start your seeds or these peat moss cups. So what's fantastic about egg cartons, what I love is that they're quite wide. They're much wider than the seed starters here. So your seedlings can stay in here probably a bit more longer because I'm gonna be transplanting these um, probably after the four to five week mark into larger pots. Um, they're wider, they're not as deep. So that's also something to be aware of, but you would do the same process. You put a hole here at the bottom and then you put uh, little slips at the side to increase airflow so your roots grow really strong. Um, we also have these. These are what I'm going to be transplanting these seedlings into, or some of them at least, um, when they have outgrown the cells. So this is really hand, hand, uh, handy. <laughs> this is really handy because um, you can put these directly into the soil, whether that's in containers or directly into the ground. Um, I also have some popsicle sticks for labeling. I already showed you the seed starting mix and then some boiling water, which we're gonna be using uh, for sterilizing our soil. So this is the step in the process that many people don't um, do, whether it's because uh, they haven't been taught or um, don't understand the value in sterilizing your seed starting mix. And the reason you do that is because there can be eggs and gnats and to get rid of any sort of possibility of fungus. And so sterilizing with hot water kills that. Um, but what's also fantastic is that regardless, you want to be moistening your seed starting mix before you put them into the cells. And so it's kind of killing two birds with one stone. That's an odd saying. I don't really like it, but um, you get the gist. So what we're going to be doing is adding some of the boiling water into here and mixing it. And we want to make sure that it gets dark and that it becomes... Um, it becomes moist enough, not so when you squeeze it, water sponges out, but really so some of it gets stuck onto your hands. Because if you can see here, like it's really dry and you get that residue. You want a little bit more. And so we're going to go through that process. So I've used about, I would say, what, half, half of the water in here. So I'm going to put this entire pot in and just give it a mix, a good stir. This is like, it's a really fun process, I think. Um, don't use your hands because you just put boiling water into here and that would not be pretty. So this definitely needs more water. It soaks it up fairly quickly, but you see how it's starting to get a little bit spongier. I'm going to add about half of this larger pot. And I don't 
don't know if you can see the steam that's rising off of this mixture. That's fantastic. Um, and we have foil paper that we're gonna be using just to keep that steam in while it cools. If you're a baker, you can probably fold, but I'm gonna stir kind of like, it's like oatmeal cookies or something. Um, stir and then like kind of fold on top. We're definitely getting there. looks like when I'm done so you see how it's darkened and you get a little bit of squish but it's gonna mold right so what we're gonna do now is cover this up with foil paper to keep the steam in and while the steam and everything is cooling off and the mixture is settling I'm gonna show you guys what I'm growing um, I bought some seeds from the incredible seed company I believe they're based in Nova Scotia um, so I bought some of those and then I also picked some up at the grocery store Right now, we have Roman chamomile, which I'm really excited for. Chamomile is one of my absolute favorite herbs. Sleepy time tea, um, you can even brew it, uh, and it's really great for your plants to assist with fungi. I'll be also growing some spearmint um, for teas, uh, some Genovese basil, which I'm really excited for. I'm also going to be growing wild lupin, which I'm going to be cold stratifying later in this video. I'm really excited for wild lupin. It's absolutely gorgeous. I intended to grow some last year, but it was so odd because the seeds I got were actually for calla lilies. And I was like, hmm, I didn't mind it though. Um, common milkweed, which I'm really looking forward to. All of this, the next, yeah, these next flowers and herbs will be cold stratified. Um, I'm also growing anise hyssop and echinacea, 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 I don't know, but, uh, essentially these will all be cold stratified later in this video. I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be really helpful for colds and flus and just, uh, strengthening the immune system of myself, but also my family. Um, Mammoth Red Rock Cabbage. I love cabbage so deeply. I love how it sounds when I chew it. And so this is going to be really, I'm excited to grow this one. Uh, dinosaur Kale. I love kale. I love the way this kale looks. I love the texture. It's just a really fascinating, um, fascinating looking kale. So I'm excited for this. And what's fantastic about this, because I'm in zone five. And so if you live in any colder climates, like these will go through up until snow. I had a friend who was growing this and it was like December and snow on the ground and we're going out into her backyard um, and picking some of this up to eat. I'm also growing De Chico broccoli. De Chico? Uh, this is going to be cool. Um, glacier tomatoes which are fantastic because they grow um, quite quickly. Not quite quickly but I think the harvest comes quite quickly like quicker than other tomatoes. Um, and it's also great for northern climates. Lemon balm. Love a good lemon balm tea. Um, love the smell of lemon balm, so this is going to be really handy as well. I'm growing some Greek oregano, our classic thyme. Love thyme. Cilantro. Garden sweet burpless hybrid cucumbers. Nance half long carrots as well as Baby Boomer Hybrid uh, Cherry Tomatoes. So I'm going to be growing minus the four flowers. So minus anise hyssop, um, common milkweed, echinacea, and what was the other one? Oh, wild lupin. Minus those four, I'm going to be growing the rest in containers. Um, so this is going to be a channel that focuses largely on container gardening. 
Um, and that's fantastic because what I love about container gardening is that it's accessible. You could have, you can do container gardening in your home. You can do container gardening on your balcony. You can do container gardening even if you have a large amount of land. Um, it's just a really accessible way to garden. And um, with that, it also requires more attention because the plants and the vegetables and the fruits that you're growing are not going to be able to, one, develop mycelium. It won't be able to develop uh, or reach out to any of the nutrients within the soil. So you'll need more fertilizer. Um, but those are processes that we're going to get into as the season progresses. Um, and I think one of the plans and what I love about gardening in general is the fact that um it's a gift that keeps on giving within one of these seeds within like one plant or one fruit of like this plant are so many seeds that then you can preserve um for the next season for coming up seasons you can share with friends and family with your larger community which i intend to do because i think that um i really wish that more people garden. I think a lot more people would if they had a know-how or had access to um, access to the materials that uh, you need to garden. It's like a it can be very intimidating to begin, but like most things, once you step out of your comfort zone and you start to practice and try and learn, because I know for a fact I'm going to make lots of mistakes. Hopefully, not a lot of mistakes that. Um, nothing occurs, but regardless, all the mistakes I make will be learning opportunities that will assist me as I continue on this gardening journey. Um, but yeah, you can save and preserve these seeds and I'm going to make a process or make a video that discusses how to um, preserve our seeds. Um, and it would be also fantastic and one of my goals is to start like a, a seed starting library. So you know how people have like those like those libraries on their front lawns with um, books like grab one, take one, give one, etc. for free. How fantastic would it be if we had that for um, for seeds? Like, hey, I grew this fantastic species of cucumber and it was so delicious and um, I have so many seeds, enough for me to last my family years and years and years if I kept them all. So why not just give them to people? Is I can go over some of the design systems and organization that I'll be using to keep track of the seedlings and also just keep track of the seeds as um, as the season progresses, right? Um, I'm a Virgo rising and uh, organization is very, 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 very important for me. I like having systems that allow it to become a whole lot easier for me to keep track of and I think especially when you're just starting it can be very easy to get flustered and I know I'm growing a lot and so having this process has really helped me or having these processes and so first I'll show you what I'll be using for the seed starting cells you can do this if you're using uh, the peat moss pots or if you're using the egg cartons and so if you're growing a lot of things oh if you're growing anything really you should label um, label because you think you'll remember but past the six to eight week point you won't be able to recognize okay that's cabbage oh that's chamomile like it'll be a lot more difficult and so with the seed starting cells um, you can see I added like these little triangles from those labeling things that just like tip like cut off the corner so I have an orange one a blue one a green one and a red one and I put that on each corner um, because what I'm going to be doing as the seeds are germinating, I'm going to be rotating, rotating this every two to three days. So then the stems don't start to like lean to one side or lean to the other. Um, it's a bit more even. So I'm going to be doing that every two to three days. And so because I know that um, I'm creating this and as I'm putting, it's a little paper. I just have like the red, the blue. What is that green and the orange and as i'm doing that um as i'm putting the seeds into the cells and the soil into the cells i will be uh keeping track uh, okay so like the first four uh between red and green i know are chamomile perfect i'm just going to draw little circles write the name in there so it'll be really handy for when i start to transplant these pots or even when, because some of the uh, some of them are going to germinate a lot quicker and be ready to transplant a lot quicker, 
And so that'll help me keep track. Okay, today I took out mint. Um, however, basil and the tomatoes are still here. So I'm gonna scratch out mint and um, do that. And what's fantastic too is that um, if you're growing seedlings at different stages, which I recommend if you do want to receive a harvest um, more than just like within one time span, I'm, I would recommend starting seedlings uh, like six to eight weeks. Typically that's recommended six to eight weeks before your last frost. And you can look up your last frost date on the internet. Um, I would recommend starting one patch or one batch of seedlings and then waiting two weeks, three weeks um, to start another batch. So then you have that larger range of, of harvesting season. Um, it's also handy too, because if you live in a zone where you can grow, or if you're growing crops that are great for the summer, but then crops that are also suited to winter, it helps you keep track um, if there's any overlap for when you're um, seeding those two crops. Um, yeah, I think that's everything for, I think that's everything for, uh, oh no, <laughs> this is the thing. So I, I've been taking a permaculture uh, course for the past few months and I have really found it, I, I was really centered on not just designing um, the garden so that it would produce like optimal fruit, but I also want to design the garden so that it would actually work with the many systems that are present on this section of property that um, I live at. And so I wanted to do that, but I also wanted to ensure that I was planting things that were beneficial for the soil, uh, beneficial for uh, the, the ecosystem that is present. So for like the monarch butterflies, for the caterpillars, for the worms, for all of those things, because um, the abundance that you reap from gardening shouldn't just go to you <laughs> it should really assist in caring for the earth that's just my personal philosophy when it comes to um gardening when it comes to just living in general um and so uh, having a, jar a garden journal a garden journal is really really helpful at the very beginning like months ago i just like kept track of like some of the things i wanted to grow and like what their sun conditions were, what their soil conditions were, what their companion plants with are, are um, what their companion plants are, um, some of their um, common pests, and uh, what else did I write? How to care for them, how often to fertilize them, right? So just having a bit of a guide um, just to consider in the design process. I also have actual design. So I've gone through two to three designs. I'm going to go through this process in another video, but two to three designs. It keeps changing. And honestly, once I'm done these seedlings, I'm going to probably change it again. Um, but having just a design system, if you know where you're going to plant, I highly recommend observing, observing deeply where it is that um, you intend to grow because um, the soil conditions, I mean the soil conditions, the sun conditions change, like is it, is it really, really windy in a certain area? Um, do you notice lots of birds, lots of rabbits, lots of animals um, in certain areas? Just really, how does the water flow when it rains? Does the water flow directly into where it is that you want to grow a, a crop that doesn't really, can't be oversaturated with water. So these are lots of fantastic and important things to consider when you're starting your garden. Um, and it'll shift, it'll shift. My garden this year is probably not gonna look like my garden next year, right? I think what's so fantastic is that in observation, um, things change um, and that's good. Uh, one of the other, I would recommend two things in general, and this is even if you're not growing vegetables or you're not growing herbs, in general, if you are taking care or tending to any plant life, the two things that are going to save you and almost guarantee um, that your plants will thrive, observation, constant observation, you cannot over observe, and um, replicating nature. Um, so observe your plants, observe the seedlings, observe um, observe how they are when they are transplanted. transplanted. 
Um, do you want to, when do you, you want to harden the moth? When do they need fertilizer? Like these are all things that you're going to get lots of information about on the internet, but being aware that in observation, you're seeing it through a lens that's directly tied to you. So someone who might be exactly in your zone, um, who is growing exactly what you're growing might not have had the same conditions that you had, for example. So if you're growing tomatoes and so that person you watched on YouTube was growing the same tomatoes in the same zone, but they had a really beautiful sunny summer versus one that was cloudy and windy and rainy. Let your plants speak to you um, and let that inform how you tend to them, how you care to them. Um, and then also replicating nature, for example, a lot of these things are not native to where it is that I live. They're not indigenous to where I live. And so um, some of them, for example, oregano, uh, basil are, and like, yeah, a lot of these things are used to climates that are very hot, that are very dry. And I can't guarantee that here. And so using that knowledge you have and looking at where these things originally came from, try your best to replicate that process. Um, that's going to help you learn how to adapt, how to adapt your practices, your watering uh, practices, uh, your placement, a bunch of other things when it comes to anything that you grow. And, even when it comes to like your house plants, for example, if you have tropical house plants, you know for a fact um, they do not want dry, cold air. They would detest that, and that makes sense because that's not what they're used to. If they're used to growing in a certain environment, do your best to to replicate that. Um, but yeah, these are some of the systems. I'll go into more detail over this uh, gardening process. Things will shift. Again, what I love about this is that if you're a first time gardener, first of all, welcome. I'm so happy that you're doing something like this. Um, but I'm growing along with you. And I think that that's quite fantastic. I have some wisdom, I have some knowledge and I'm trusting my ancestors to show up because I do come from a long lineage of, of farmers. And so we are going to do this together and do our best to not only create thriving gardens that um, provide an abundance for ourselves, but then also provide an abundance for the, uh, the world and the earth and the soil and the many, many, um, organisms that assisted in getting, um, this fruit to us. And so I'm really excited for this process. And yeah. here's another thing that's going to be handy. So with all of the things I knew I was going to be growing today, I wrote down how many plants I wanted to produce. And with that, I wrote down how many seeds I'm planting. So it just helps me stay organized. Um, it never hurts to plant a bit more seeds. In fact, in each cell, I'm gonna be putting two to three seeds and then thinning them out accordingly. But if you grow, um, I don't know, if you grow seven cabbages and you really only have room for four or five, you can give those transplants away to other people who you know could really benefit from it. Soil mix is cooling off a bit more. I think it'll be done in like 15 minutes, but I just wanted to get the cells prepped. And so if you're using a cell like this, the plastic is more malleable, right? It's very, very thin. And so you wanna make sure that there are no dents in the cell just to better assist your, your uh, roots in forming in a way that is straight um, and keeps them solid. So I'd recommend just going through, putting your fingers in, you see those slits, um, just so then there are no dents. I think for me today, I'm only gonna be using one cell. I think the next time that I, I start seedlings, I will try the egg cartons and that'll be really handy. But uh, just a little check on the soil. It still has that moisture, which is fantastic. We really want and love that. When we get to the bottom of it is when there's still a bit of heat. A bit of warmth is not bad. Like I want like slightly warmer than room temperature. But when we get to the bottom, it's still, it's still a bit warm. I kind of like it. Like I love this texture. I love the heat but I don't think my seeds will. And so we're gonna give that another 10 minutes. I think it's been almost an hour. 
before we start to show you how to put the seeds in and how to make sure the soil is compact enough that it stays um, and it helps your, your seedlings bloom. So once you've ensured that your cells are prepped, we're just gonna take handfuls of the soil, put them in, spread them around until they fill a bit to the top like so to ensure that they're compact and filled evenly we're going to do a thumb press before putting some more soil inside um, and most of the seeds that i am planting do not need to be planted deeply into the soil especially as they're just beginning to uh, they're just seedlings right and so Oh my gosh, I love having my hand in the dirt. <laughs> and so um, with that, like that, a bit more on the corners here. Perfect. So now everything is about down there, but you're going to see. We're going to do a thumb press and see how, what's that? All that room? So we're just going to do thumb presses. Once that's done, add a little bit more. Some of them need to be more filled up than others. And that is okay. You give the same amount of tending and tending to and care to each and every plant. Um, and what I'm going to do is fill it up so then the tops are good up to the top, like so. So this is the final product, right? So we have this down. And essentially, I'm gonna show you an example at the regular pace, how I'm gonna do it with one seed, and then we're just gonna do a really fast, little fast-paced thing. Um, so yeah, this is what it looks like right now, leveled off, or like here. And what I'm going to do is place little holes, little holes, nothing too deep, nothing too crazy, like so. And I'm going to get some chamomile seeds. And so what I'm going to do is take two of these for four cells and put them in each of those holes. And when I put them into the holes, I'm literally just gonna play with the soil on top and just like flow it over, right? So we're gonna do that. I have my, uh, my tracking here. And then once I'm done that, I'm gonna draw it in these circles. Now we have four chamomile cells filled. And what I'm gonna do literally is just go like this. Mix it up. Pat very lightly, mix it up, pat very, very lightly. You're just taking the thing, the hole that you made and covering it up. So now I know we have one, two, three, four chamomiles in the red corner to the green corner. And I wrote that down. All right, so here we have our cells with our little chart. Fantastic, I'm really excited to see how they grow. Another thing I didn't mention was pay attention to what it says for the seed depth on the, um, on the seed packages. For example, because mint, you barely have to cover it. Whereas for cucumbers, you have to go a little deeper. Same with kale, cabbage, deep rooted, think a little deeper in the soil. So now we have our cell tray 
and we're gonna do a bottom watering for 30 minutes. We're gonna do 30 minutes because the soil was already moist. So I'm choosing to do bottom watering for a few reasons. One, um, well, the seeds or the, the seed starting has already been moistened, right? And because some of the cells are lightly watered, I mean, are, are lightly uh, packed, um, I don't wanna water it and have the seeds go out. And I really wanna start to promote that root a work absorbing from the bottom. There are many reasons you can choose either or, but this is just the method that I'm going to do. And the way we do that is that we fill this container, which is what? Two, two and a half to three inches. And we're going to fill the, uh, the one third of it up with water. We're going to let these sit in there for 30 minutes to an hour, depending. And this is the method I'm going to continue with throughout the process. I think that once, um, these will let you know when it has to be watered. When you see this start to turn the color of the seed starting mix beforehand, so we're talking about that light brown, um, and it goes like I would say a little bit like that, that's when we're going to do the bottom watering. Um, and that's really going to promote the roots grabbing up nutrients and water from below. I also just want to explain, so cold stratification, you do cold stratification to mimic the conditions of winter. So a lot of these seeds, you don't have to, the ones that you do cold stratification for, you don't have to wait until the spring to put them into the ground. If you want, you can direct sow them um, in winter. So then the seeds can prepare um, for sun because it's that transition when they're used to the cold. Um, they know, okay, I'm not gonna be doing anything. I'm resting, I'm doing my thing. And then come spring, when the soil starts to warm up, that's when they're like, oh, it's time to grow. And so this helps, cold stratification helps signal to certain plants that it's time to grow, especially if you are not planting it in uh, the winter. So it's recommended for a lot of perennials. Uh, you can just always make sure, just Google to check. Um, so I finished the anise hyssop. I'm gonna write the date that I am putting, starting the cold stratification process. So you see that there. And we're gonna do the same now for milkweed and for the wild lupin. And so yes, just want to also stay, make sure you're always paying attention to what the label says. And if yours do, does not have a label, just Google, read a book, find some information. For example, when I take these Annie's Hyssop out of the bag to plant them into the cells, I'm going to barely cover it with soil, right? Whereas for, oh my gosh, where's Echinacea? Echinacea, I'll probably do around the same, but milkweed, for example, might need a little bit deeper and same with uh, wild lupin. Wild lupin doesn't need that much of a difference, like one eighth, but still, it's always important to pay attention to what your label says. Gosh, and do not forget to label so you do not forget what it is that you planted. Labeling is so important. So it's like this. We'll start with the small ones and for the small ones, we're gonna do a genesia and we will do some anise hyssop. Um, oh, perfect. These are the top two. So we have our small plastic bag. We have our sterilized potting mix, which is still good, moisturized and everything. And what you're going to do is fill the bag up about one third of the way with the seed starting mix. so like so and I'm gonna compact it a bit if your soil is a little dry you're gonna take your spray bottle spray it once or twice and then for the echinacea we'll start with the echinacea I'm going to put in how many do I want to put in? Eight to ten seeds. I'm gonna open up the package. 
These seeds are pretty large, which is fantastic. to spill. <laughs> so that's our Echinacea. And these ones, we're just going to sprinkle in. That's definitely more than 10. And that's okay. And then we're going to take a handful of soil again. And just cover it so. So now it's about a little less than halfway. I'm going to water it again just two times. And then what I want you to do is squeeze the air out so it's almost like a vacuum seal, as close as you can. What I like to do is close it. After I get as much air as I can out, close it about like until there's an inch left. And then really squeeze, 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 squeeze the air until you have something like this. And what we're gonna do, you're gonna follow the same process for the rest of the cold stratification. Uh, there are other ways to do this. Um, typically you wanna cold stratify for like a week, uh, I mean not a week, a month, so four weeks in advance. And you could just do it in the fridge. However, because I wanna plant these sooner, I'm gonna be doing the fridge freezer method. And so I'm gonna do this with the rest of the plants. And after this is done, I'm going to do this for a week. We're going to spend the first day, keep it in the fridge. Second day, put it in the freezer. Third day, put it in the fridge and then alternate like that. So fridge, freezer, fridge, freezer. And then after a week, today is the 10th of April. And uh, after a week, so on the next Monday, today's Sunday, but on the Monday, the 18th is when I'm going to take these out and then uh, gather the seeds and um, put them into the seed starting mixture. And so that's gonna be the plan. So we're just gonna do this for the week and we are most likely going to start these in the peat moss pots, but that's the process. Soil, sprinkle some seeds, sprinkle a bit more soil on the top, get all the air out of this plastic bag, put it in the fridge, then put it in the freezer. So you're gonna be alternating like that. So I'm gonna get that process done for the rest of the flowers and I will catch you after that. So here we have the uh, seeds that are ready for stratification. Our cells have been here for I think just about 20 minutes and I can feel that they're already getting a little bit wet at the top. That's good. We're going to give it another 15. Put these in the freezer and then close it off. Here we have it. I have set up a bit of like a sun station really high. I'm literally stacking two things so they can get the most sun as possible. This is east, east, I believe a southern facing window. I could be so wrong, but I know the east is there, over there, west is right over there. And these are here now. I'm going to use this cover, a little greenhouse cover, just to help them sprout better. It's like a humidifier. And then the moment they start to sprout is when I'll leave this off. Another thing I'm gonna do is ensure that it's at least 21 degrees plus in here. It is in here naturally because of the heating. Uh, but if I feel like it needs a little bit, be a little bit warmer, I have a space heater to create more heat in this area. Another thing too is that once I start to see stems, I am going to use a tower fan and create the conditions of wind. And that'll assist uh, the stems in growing strong before I decide to harden off the plants, which is essentially preparing them um, to be planted outside, which is and hardening off. You put them outside for a few extra hours every day. Um, so they get used to the environment that they will ultimately be growing in. So yeah, these are going to be here. Oops. <laughs> these are going to be here for the next six to eight weeks when I um, sow the, uh, the perennial flowers. I'm going to put them on this lower edge and they'll also get some sun. 
Um, but there we have it, everyone. Uh, that was the entire seed starting process. I'm very excited to see what occurs. And I hope that this helps you in your own process. And if not, um, hopefully you found some enjoyment in watching this process. And I will keep you updated. Have a good one.